Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so check out Linode. With private networking, shared block storage, node balancers, and a 200 gigabit network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to scale. Go to podcast.init.com slash Linode to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. Finding a bug in production is never a fun experience, especially when your users find it first. Airbrake error monitoring ensures that you will always be the first to know, so you can deploy a fix before anyone is impacted. With open source agents for Python 2 and 3, it's easy to get started, and the automatic aggregations, contextual information, and deployment tracking ensure that you don't waste time pinpointing what went wrong. Go to podcastinit.com slash airbrake today to sign up and get your first 30 days free and 50% off three months of the startup plan. To get worry-free releases, download GoCD, the open-source continuous delivery server built by ThoughtWorks. You can use their pipeline modeling and value stream map to build, control, and monitor every step from commit to deployment in one place. And with their new Kubernetes integration, it's even easier to deploy and scale your build agents. Go to podcastinit.com slash GoCD to learn more about their professional support services and enterprise add-ons. And visit the site at podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, and read the show notes. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Christine Spang about Nihilus and the modern era of email. So Christine, could you start by introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, My name is Christine, and I am the co-founder and CTO of Nihilus. A little bit about myself, I guess, kind of before that. I went to college at MIT. I worked a little bit at a kernel startup called Caseplace, which was started by some friends of mine um, who I met at the MIT Computer Club. Um, And then about four and a half years ago, I started this company called Nihilus. And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yeah, for sure. So I basically got into kind of like computing and like programming in high school through basically through um, working with free and open source software. So I started contributing to Debian Linux when I was in high school and I started to teach myself Python for the first time as a part of wanting to contribute to Debian. So I wanted to like work on some package that was written in Python. So I you know found some online tutorials and started teaching myself Python. Um, that way. And then at MIT, I was a class of 2010, and they were basically like transitioning their computer science curriculum at that time. So I was like the in-between year where they had a new curriculum where kind of the introductory courses were in Python and an old curriculum where all the introductory courses were in Lisp. So I kind of took a little bit of both. Um, So I got a chance to use Python a bunch in college as well. And you mentioned that a few years ago you helped to found the Nihilus company. So I'm wondering if you can just explain a bit about what it is that Nihilus does and some of the history of getting it off the ground. Yeah, for sure. So Nihilus is basically a modern REST API that makes it really easy for developers to plug email, contacts, and calendar into any application. So the idea for the company came from actually uh, my co-founder, who's a friend of mine from college, was trying to build um, basically some kind of like new products and experiences that worked with email and as a part of his undergraduate thesis. And he basically found that he spent several months just trying to actually like pull the data out and display it because all of the kind of technology to integrate with email uh, was very complicated. So kind of the thesis was that One of the reasons that people haven't been building a lot of new things that have been really taking off um, and making it easier to work with email is that because it is so difficult to develop with. So what we took out of that was basically that we needed to make it easier to work with email so that people could be able to like experiment and innovate with like kind of the ways that you're able to use it. Um, So that's how we ended up basically kind of building this uh, kind of server infrastructure and API that abstracts away 50 years of email uh, history and makes it so that you can work with email using the modern developer tools um, that people expect these days. 
and email as a protocol and a means of communication has been around for a number of years and its death has been predicted time and again but it continues to maintain relevance and stay as one of the primary means of getting in touch and maintaining lines of communication so i'm wondering if you have any theories as to what has made it so resilient in the face of so many different new protocols and means of discussion in, that have been developed in recent years I think there's a few things that contribute to this. One is that by nature, email is distributed. So uh, at this point, there are uh, millions of servers out there that help people connect to the email network. And if you have your email hosted at any one provider, you can talk to anyone at any other email provider. And I think that this property has been a key reason why um, email has become kind of so sticky and such a, a key facet of how modern business communication works. There's no other system out there that essentially is is an open network that doesn't require everyone to be on the same system. So all of these new systems that people have been kind of touting as email killers throughout the throughout the years lose this key property of email. And because there's so much infrastructure out there that kind of keeps the email network going, um, it's hard to replace that. And also a lot of the systems that are trying to unseat email as the main means of communication are largely more synchronous in nature, whereas the async aspect of email makes it more beneficial to business communications and more thoughtful discourse because you are able to take the time to write the message that you want to write and ensure that you don't have any sort of grammatical errors or in make sure that you're including all the different talking points that you want, whereas things like IRC or Slack encourage a much more rapid fire communication, which is great when you're doing real-time interaction with people, but when you want to have a more thoughtful and reasoned discourse, email is a much better method of doing that because of that lack of urgency. I'm with you on that. And one of the early product offerings that you built at Nihilus was the N1 mail client, which was very popular at the time that you first launched it. And a little while after that, and I don't remember the exact timeline, but you decided to actually sunset that project, which is now living on in a couple of open source iterations. But I'm wondering what the I'm wondering if you can share some of the lessons that you learned from the process of building that client and integrating it with your platform and how that has informed your current focus and where you're spending your energies right now. I think that N1 was a really useful product for us really stress testing our API in the early days. Um, it helped to kind of have a super heavyweight client that basically did all of the things in order to kind of really make sure that our API worked for any sort of client that you might want to build. And for that reason, I think it was totally worthwhile for us to have built it. Um, we kind of had the thesis in that day that, I mean, we were experimenting on kind of what an email platform for the future might look like. So the first thing that we built was kind of this data API, and that was kind of one iteration of what the future of email as a platform might look like. Uh, the second thing we built was this email client, which was an experiment in, hey, maybe people might want to, instead of having to build entire applications, build kind of like really powerful plugins into like an email client that is built for extensibility. And our experience was that, and I think it's still possible that this kind of like vision might be a thing that could work someday, but it didn't work in this iteration for uh, a number of reasons. One is just kind of like having a split focus as a company where, you know, we're a small team or startup and having kind of two major products uh, it was really difficult to support from an engineering standpoint. It definitely caused a lot of kind of tension internally as to like where we were spending our resources because, uh, you know, N1 essentially like required the API to to work. Um, and yet it also required a very different skill set for folks to be kind of successful at working on it. So it's hard for people to work on it on both parts at the same time. And also just hard for us to like resource each project appropriately with a small team. So that was one thing. One, another thing was basically that we, we found it very difficult to, to honestly, to make enough money to make up for the costs of N1. 
just through selling the email client. We essentially had this like longer term vision where we were going to like build uh, kind of plugin packages on top of N1 and those would be the products that people would kind of be using uh, at the end. But when you think about it and you're also kind of already dealing with a constrained team, then you have three things. One is an API infrastructure, which in itself is like pretty complex. Second is like the space email client, which is, you know, a uh, an extensible system. And the third is like these kind of plug-in packages. Uh, so that's a lot of stuff to support. And honestly, we just didn't really have uh, kind of the size of team and time necessary to kind of build that into a successful business, even if even if it had looked promising as to how we could kind of charge for it. For base email clients, people just don't expect to pay for them these days, so it's very hard to make money just selling an email client. And the business of Nihilus, uh, looking at the about pages and the fact that you've open sourced your employee handbook and some of the uh, blog post that you've written has a very strong focus on encouraging diversity and a very open nature of the company. So I'm wondering if you can speak a bit to some of the ways that you encourage that type of environment and how it manifests at work and some of the challenges that you've had to overcome to ensure that that aspect of the company is continued as you add new people and the culture shifts with the inclusion of new people and the different dynamics that they bring to the table. This is super important. For me personally, diversity and inclusion is incredibly important. And I came to it because, you know, I am a woman in tech. And my my experience throughout the years has been generally very positive in the industry. But I know a lot of people and I also know that I've been really lucky and that kind of being early career, you also like don't see some of the like roadblocks um, that people tend to see later on where they stop getting promoted. So it was important to me as part of starting a new organization from scratch that we really do our best to create an environment where <clears throat> all sorts of different people can be successful, not just kind of the status quo of what's worked in the past. There's a few things that we've done to um, kind of work on that. One is is just like having a female founder helps attract kind of different sorts of people to the company, um, especially for especially because I am highly technical. A few things that we do to kind of like kind of propagate the culture. One thing I think that we got right from the get go was creating a core team that really also values diversity and inclusion, and it's important to have buy in from the team because. These sorts of things take actual work, and if people aren't excited about working them and think that they're important, then they're just not actually going to work on it. And it also takes a lot of work on, on oneself personally, kind of examining one's own biases and doing things to address them. So it's really important that the team thinks that diversity and inclusion are important things to work on. Otherwise, um, you're kind of fighting an uphill battle. But once you do have that in place, um, it's much easier for to kind of grow the team because your team who's on your interview panels will help kind of find people who also kind of buy into this overall uh, value. We try to ask everyone who goes through our interview circuits, you know, what they think about kind of diversity and inclusion and make sure that they buy into it. We also work with some organizations that are kind of like training new folks uh, from different backgrounds and getting them into the tech, tech industry. One organization we've been working with uh, is called Hackbright, which is a uh, coding school for women. Um, another organization that we just recently started working with, um, our VP of Engineering mentored for them last summer, and this summer we have an intern joining us, joining our team, is this organization called Code2040, which is uh, kind of helping Black and Latinx uh, college students. So those organizations are really great. I'm trying to think of what else that we kind of do specifically. I try to spend more of my time uh, kind of recruiting and doing outreach to women and underrepresented minorities just because, you know, it's sometimes it can be harder to, to find people who are not the status quo. Um, so you have to invest the time. Um, and I'm really excited to kind of connect with more folks from, from different backgrounds, so I'm very happy to spend the time. 
And one of the things that can serve as either a deterrent or an attractor for people who don't necessarily fit the standard stereotype of a developer is the way that the job descriptions are written, because if there is too much of the alphabet soup or a laundry list of requirements, then it can often discourage people who might not feel that they're uh, immediately qualified for the role, whereas with a little bit of coaching, they could very easily grow into it. So I don't know if you put any special effort into the way that you write your job requirements or your uh, job postings when you are trying to hire for new positions. Yeah, that's definitely a factor. We've used this tool called Text.io to look at our job descriptions. We've also spent a fair amount of effort just kind of like writing down and describing our culture, which I think by its nature uh, appeals to a wide variety of folks, particularly because we're a very collaborative team. It's not so much a place where folks kind of go off and work on their projects by themselves. People are always working together. We heavily value uh, strong communication skills. And one thing that we did was we worked with uh, this site called Key Values, which was started by another MIT grad, Lynn Tai. And she really helped us work through the process of communicating and um, figuring out what exactly is important to us. And the site's really cool. It allows you to basically kind of browse for different companies by values. And we've we found a number of women who have reached out to us just for because of our profile on that site. Um, I think that, you know, one, it's really important to have a culture that is great. And then it's also important to communicate that culture. And so now digging further into the technical aspects of what you're doing at Nihilus. I don't know if you can provide an overview of the way that your platform is architected and some of the ways that Python is used within that architecture. So there are a couple major components of our system. At a high level, our server platform is essentially an email client implementation that will connect to any email provider out there. It downloads and caches folks' email data and makes that available via our front end API. So what that basically means is that we have a bunch of API servers, they're stateless, they're running application servers, all the application software is written in Python, and developers can set up applications in which their users will kind of get bounced out to our servers and go through an OAuth flow and connect their mailboxes to our system. And when we get a new mailbox connected to the system, we have a separate pool of machines called the sync fleet, which in the background starts basically kind of downloading a cache of all of the email data that is in that mailbox, putting it in our data store. Our data store is basically a fleet of horizontally sharded uh, MySQL machines. Uh, they're kind of standard set up with uh, primary replica pairs. Um, each mailbox is tied to a single uh, a single cluster, and the sync machines download all the data. They go through this process is basically a kind of what we call initial sync, where they have to kind of download the backlog first, and then we maintain basically persistent connections to the mailbox provider to keep that data store continually up to date, so that the data available via our API is always the latest data that's available via the email provider itself. And there are a lot of different elements of an email message that you can pull out for being able to query across. So I don't know what are some of the most used and most useful portions of the email message that people are generally accessing via the API. So when we designed the API in uh, kind of the beginning, we, we wanted to really simplify the process of actually accessing the email data. And to do that, we basically had to decide what was important for folks to be able to easily access. So if you are accessing email via kind of the traditional protocols, there's a lot of kind of uh, encodings and formattings that you have to deal with in order to kind of just drill down to an email body or to get an attachment. And our basic thesis was there's bunch of headers that are important, the email body is important, a list of attachments is important, and kind of everything else is secondary. So 
we make it really easy to kind of access and filter emails based on their recipients to from you know, CC, BCC, the subject. I think there's a few other headers that we make it possible to filter on. We make the email bodies available very easily by our, by our API, and we also allow you to, to query for attachments. And if whatever you're building needs something else, some like custom headers, stuff like that, we make the raw emails available via the API as well. But we find that the majority of our customers uh, find the basic representation sufficient. And I think that's actually one way in which we are pretty successful in the initial design of the API is getting it pretty right what were the most important things that people need for most most things that they want to build. You mentioned that the primary focus of Nihilus is as a means of synchronizing a user's entire mailbox and then exposing the data contained therein via an API. I'm wondering what are some of the typical use cases that that enables and some of the ways that people have generally been using that Nihilus API? So the biggest, kind of the, the most typical way that people use our API is for building various sorts of vert vertical specific CRMs. So if you've ever heard the phrase, there's an app for that, what we've found is that there's also a CRM for that. Um, there are all sorts of interesting and um, kind of unexpected CRMs that we've found, um, and they're all kind of need these basic features of, of email and calendaring um, and address books. And the way that they do that is through that Nihilus platform. So for example, there's people who have built real estate CRMs on us. There's people who have built hiring applications. There's people who have built support tools. There's people who have built aut automotive CRMs, applications to like manage your like salon business. It turns out that communication is kind of like a core human need and all of these tools that are specific for managing some sort of business need these features. And you know how like back in the day, web frameworks kind of enabled people to build web applications for doing just about anything. Like there's web applications for managing climbing gyms these days. And these frameworks made it so easy to develop web apps that people could do that. One of the things that we want to see happen as a result of Nihilus is all of these applications basically grow these kind of embedded communications and scheduling tools because it means that people have to switch context less, they're more effective at their jobs, they have to do less kind of drudgery and manual manual kind of like data entry. And they couldn't do that before because it was just really hard to connect to email mailboxes. And for somebody who is using Nihilus to create these CRMs and various communications tools, is the user-facing portion generally something of, on the order of a contact form where somebody will land on the page, fill out the form to request some information or sign up for some sort of mailing list, etc. And then the Nihilus API will then take that, convert it into an email, and then put it into somebody's mailbox? Or is it more that the user who's coming onto that site will link their mailbox so that aspects of their email can be accessed by the person who is using the CRM? Uh, it's more the latter. Basically, these applications will you know, have in their settings or setup a step where folks connect their user mailboxes to that application. And then that connection seamlessly powers some part of the application where, for example, you might have a page in your hiring app where you can see all of the previous communication that people at your company have made with a candidate. Um, and that's powered by Nihilus. Um, there might be an inline feature for sending out email campaigns um, using templates uh, or doing some kind of like sales automation and those features would be powered by Nihilus. So it's mostly that there's kind of two steps, one, connect your mailbox, two, basically use all of these kind of basic features that people need. And so I've been actually on the market for CRMs myself, and one of the ways that I've seen for being able to track those communications is to add a CC or BCC for a particular magic email address that will copy that 
communication chain into the CRM for being able to track the various steps of, of moving somebody through, for instance, a sales funnel. And so with Nihilus is the idea that you don't need to use that specific email account and it will just intuit based on the person's status as a contact in the database that any emails that happen to have their address in either the to or the from field will automatically be allocated to that particular communication channel. Exactly. So we just make it more seamless. So when you're developing an application, you don't have to kind of create this system that requires an email account on a mail server, have to like instruct everyone to like set up their mail clients to BCC properly. You don't have to deal with people forgetting to BCC. Um, we just pull the data straight from the mailbox. And for doing bulk email campaigns, a lot of times you'll use some form of SMTP provider, whether it's SendGrid as just a sort of pure uh, data channel or something like MailChimp for being able to craft the emails and then manage the sending. Does Nihilus serve that sort of use case as well of being that SMTP channel for being able to fan out the delivery so that you're not... Uh, for instance, going against the terms of service of Gmail and their sort of email limits that they might have? Yeah, so you should think of Nihilus as being kind of like a step farther for forward in an outreach pipeline than uh, kind of doing this bulk sending. So we don't actually provide the functionality that these kind of transactional email providers like SendGrid, Mailgun, uh, those folks provide. We... If you're using those kinds of services, you you would typically use Nihilus as kind of like step two. So, you know, do a bunch of like bulk outreach, then whoever is kind of engaging with those, you might start to use Nihilus as part of like follow up. Um, we, because we're using the kind of mailboxes themselves, don't support sending out mass email campaigns. Um, but for kind of folks that are further along in a pipeline, we provide a lot of features that basically you can't get out of these kind of uh, transactional email providers. One, our deliverability is much higher because we're sending out emails through the actual email account. Two, engagement uh, is also higher because it's you know sending emails just like as yourself. Um, and it's just generally kind of used for a different type of interaction where you're typically reaching out to fewer people. Um, and because it's sent through the actual email accounts, we actually can't send thousands of emails because all of these email providers have uh, sending limits for each day. And that's to kind of reduce spam and abuse. And we respect those limits. And what are some of the most interesting or innovative uses of Nihilus that you have seen built into some of these applications? Yeah, some of the more cool and forward-thinking things that people are doing is not only kind of accessing the email data itself, but also kind of getting more insight from like the connections between the data and stuff like that. So for example, some companies are building things where um, you're trying to find... Uh, the right person at the company to get you an introduction to someone at some other company, we have all of that kind of connection data in our database. And you can use it to essentially kind of like find out who is talking to who and um, basically get actually more information and insight out of the connection data itself. On a little bit more weirder note, um, in the early days of Nihilus, we had one person who actually was at a research lab who used our API to print out all of the emails that were sent to his research lab mailing list on a receipt paper. <laughs> and apparently the roll was like a thousand feet long or something like that. It was pretty crazy. So Nihilus APIs, suitable for everything from serious business to crazy hacks. And given the fact that you're dealing with people's personal or work email accounts in their inboxes, and there's potentially a lot of private or sensitive data that's contained in that, I imagine that you have to have a lot of security checks and security protocols in place on the infrastructure that you're using to manage that data. So I don't know if you can talk to some of the controls that you have to ensure that there aren't any data breaches or any 
uh, access leaks of the data for people who don't, shouldn't be able to uh, view any particular aspects of those communications? Obviously, security is a really, really important part of any email platform, and we take it super, super seriously. Some things that we are doing to ensure that users' data stays private are we're working on uh, kind of complying with all of the various different uh, data privacy laws. So uh, there's uh, GDPR, which is the new European Data Privacy Protection Law, which goes into effect in May. Um, we are classified as a data processor uh, according to that law, which means we have kind of slightly less stringent requirements than people who are data controllers. Um, but we are well on track to kind of providing the abilities to export people's private data and also to ensure the right to be forgotten. So if anyone wants all of their data to be cleared out of our systems, they can just send a request in and uh, we'll make sure that that is deleted within the kind of uh, allotted time period. Uh, beyond that, we're also uh, going through the kind of enterprise compliance called SOC2, um, which uh, we don't have a timeline for specifically completing that, but we're kind of in the middle of the process and it should happen sometime in the next, you know, some number of months. We also uh, have, you know, folks, engineers on our team who work on security and um, ensure things like, you know, making sure all of our external points of presence are patched and up to date, um, making sure that uh, all onboarded employees go through security training, that folks are using uh, encrypted hard drives, that um, we use the principle of least privilege and folks don't have access to the production databases uh, if they don't need to, that data is encrypted at rest. Um, so we kind of encrypt all of the like mail message data that's in our databases. We need to keep some kind of metadata and headers unencrypted. Uh, because it needs to be kind of queryable, but generally it's kind of like an ongoing process that we're continually trying to improve and already kind of uh, following the best industry best practices and uh, yeah, looking to kind of do as good a job as is possible there in terms of keeping people's data private. And what are some of the biggest challenges that you are facing either currently or in the past or anticipate in the future, whether from a technical level or from the business perspective? On a technical level, email inherently these days involves a lot of data just in terms of sheer volume. So our biggest scaling bottleneck from the beginning has always been the size of that data. That's why we had to shard our databases within the first year. And looking forward with regards to our application architecture, that's kind of one of the biggest constraints. So as we're kind of looking forward to adding the next, you know, million mailboxes, we, we know that we have to architect our system so that the data will scale and that so all of our kind of services will keep operating. Um, in the face of all of that data. We also kind of see the next phase of kind of product development uh, beyond just kind of providing the raw access to data is actually kind of providing tools that help people extract this like extra insight and information out of the data that belongs to them. So that's kind of like creating data processing pipelines, um, kind of doing some basic kind of machine learning, sentiment analysis, uh, type classification, extracting contact information from signatures. So there's all sorts of kind of things that are challenging about kind of building those sorts of data pipelines at scale and kind of providing a reliable service. So kind of one thing that's tricky and interesting about running a platform, which makes it super, super fun to work on as an engineer is just kind of the need to be able to like look at what any particular user's experience is. And that user is a developer. They have an application that's running against us. They make some set of API calls and, you know, we need to have like the instrumentation and introspection capabilities to actually like verify that our platform is working as intended for any given application, which might be doing different things. Yeah, I mean, on the business side, we're looking at kind of selling to larger companies going forward. And, 
you know, that brings its own kind of additional kind of compliance and also kind of like sales challenges. So we were kind of working on scaling our sales team. And on a more personal level, you originally started the company, I'm assuming, as a sole contributor. And now that you are growing and adding more people, your role as the CTO, I imagine, is causing you to have to spend less time uh, digging into the code and working on the technical details and dealing more with the people management aspect. So I'm wondering if you can just talk a bit about how you have found that transition. You're totally correct that in the beginning of the company, I was an individual contributor. I contributed large parts to our IMAP sync engine and kind of the other parts of our infrastructure and API. Throughout the last four and a half years, I've worn a lot of different hats, as is the nature of any startup. And you know, there was a point when the entire engineering team also reported to me, so uh, kind of was a full-time manager at one point. And it's definitely been kind of, I would say, up and down. I highly recommend to anyone who's thinking about starting a company to get some management experience beforehand, if you can, because it's kind of a bit of a stressful experience to be flying by the seat of your pants and, you know, trying to do the best for the company and also trying to, like, learn all of these, like, people management skills at the same time while feeling like you're not competent anymore because you're doing something completely different from what you've been doing for a number of years and feel like you're actually good at. At this point, personally, I feel like I'm like over the hump and it's like starting to get easier. And I have five people who report to me. Some of those are individual contributors. We also have a VP of engineering who's been helping us scale the management for the engineering team. And that's been super, super helpful. I'm also spending more of my time these days on kind of external facing things like working with our investors, um, doing a lot of kind of recruiting to grow the team and just kind of like building relationships with folks outside the company since that's instrumental for our success going forward. And there's definitely challenges to that. I am definitely an introvert by nature and I've had to kind of figure out how to manage my time so that I can make sure I'm able to recharge my batteries. But I'm also really excited at like, if you think about it, a system where the components are made up of people is also a system. So there's like elements of like the type of thinking that you do as an individual contributor solving problems that you can bring to kind of building the organization itself. So I'm really excited about kind of building the machine that builds the machine, uh, if that makes sense. But it's been a bit of a journey to get there for sure. There were times when I was like, just wanted to go back and code. Yeah, it's definitely a challenging transition to make when you're so used to going so deep in the software stack and trying to build up that context and maintain the overall architecture and how everything's playing together and then having it be so deterministic and then having to move to trying to translate that understanding to people who are very much non-deterministic and have so many different variables that you have to account for and how the overall team is functioning and making sure that they have what they need to be able to learn and grow successfully. So it's a challenging transition to make and I respect anybody who's able to make that transition and be successful in that role. So congratulations on that. And given that you are so close to the subject of email as a technology and how people are using it, I wonder if you have any uh, predictions as to how the future of email will play out or any trends that you see developing that would be interesting to call out. There's a couple different things uh, here. So one is kind of like an infrastructure side of things. So right now, email providers and email platforms have, we're just really not designed for the types of things that people are trying to build for today. So I see kind of in the future in kind of like the five to 10 year time span of these types of like more modern features kind of be, being built directly into email providers so that you don't need to have these like intermediate steps of, oh, we need to like take all this data and translate it into a totally different form so that we can use it for something useful. Second is kind of like built-in abilities to connect parts of your mailbox to other applications. 
it's essentially like all or nothing right now. You can either like give some app like full access to your mailbox or not at all, which I was just like not a great place to be for security. And it's because email, when email was designed, no one was like, no one thought that you were going to want to connect parts of your mailbox to like 20 different applications. You know, email was for sending communication person to person, but email has changed a lot in the way that people are using it. And when email was first designed, you know, your mailbox might have had a limit of like, you know, 10 megabytes or something like that, or, or less back way back in the day. And now there's just like so much wealth of information in there that I think that kind of the data is, is going to be key going forward as to like what email turns into kind of on the like user experience side. I like, we don't really know what that will look like. What we're excited to do as a platform is to like enable people to like experiment and try many different things. Um, and then build the tools that make it so that many people can like build, build those things easier and faster because everyone kind of needs the same things at the end of the day. I think that kind of like, because there's so much interesting data here and it's all very unstructured, kind of like machine learning and like AI technologies will become important at some point because you essentially need to like, you know, pull the signal out of the noise. And yeah, we don't know exactly how that will look and kind of excited about working with folks who want to figure it out. So for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow the work that you're up to, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And with that, I'll move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose Trello, which is a tool that you can use for being able to easily track either to-dos or process workflows, or you can use it as a project management tool. It's just a very flexible platform, and I've been able to get a lot of value out of that. I largely use it for managing my podcast interviews lately, so uh, it's been valuable for that. And uh, so anybody who's looking for any sort of task tracking or uh, being able to have sort of just put ideas, uh, it's a great place for that. So uh, with that, I'll pass it to you, Christine. Do you have any picks this week? Yeah, sort of um, a little bit random or kind of on a different note. There is this really cool website that just launched today. It's called Founders for Change. And the basic gist of it is it's kind of a compilation of different founders at many different companies who are committed to improving diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. So if you have a company or are thinking of starting a company or are looking to join a company that cares about diversity and inclusion, uh, you should check out the website. It's at foundersforchange.org. Just launched. Great. Uh, well, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today and discuss the work you're doing at Nihilus. Uh, it's definitely an interesting platform and one that appears to have a lot of useful potential. So thank you for that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. For sure. It's great to meet you, Tobias, and enjoy the rest of your day as well. Thank you. Thank you.